Hey everyone, I'm professional photographer Ian Plant and I'm here with Lilia Khalif from oh. Outdoor Photography Guide and we're here to give you another thrilling episode of OPG Live. Actually, it's not really that thrilling of an episode. And oh, the reason, it's thrilling every time. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, on some level it is, but the reason why I'm not thrilled is because this is the last episode we're going to be doing in the old format. Yeah. And we've got this great new exciting format planned for you. You can see that the studio is beginning to change. Uh, these are just, you know, a work in progress right now. It's under construction. So the next episode of OPG Live is going to be much different, much better, much more dynamic, much more professional looking. It's going to look a lot like a professional news broadcast, yeah. which means, Lilia, you know what we have to do for that. What do we have to do? We have to violently disagree over something that's completely <laughs> irrelevant. Okay. It'll be like polarizer filters, love them or hate them. papers to shuffle and throw around? Well, yes, too? we can. Okay. But the, the important thing is to have lots of disagreement in okay. this hyper-partisan news environment. It'll have to be like polarizer know. filters, love them or hate them. I love them. I hate them. Okay, so They're something terrible. like that. Yeah. Uh, so things are going to be really exciting in the next episode. So right now we just have to muddle through this last episode in this <laughs> currently thoroughly depressing old format. Uh, but today what I thought is I'm thinking about how excited I am for the new format, how I can't wait for the, the next few weeks to pass so we can do the next episode of OPG Live with this exciting new format. It got me thinking about the passage of time and how time is a really important factor when you're taking photographs. Now, no matter what you do when you take a photograph, you're completely freezing what you see. So even if you're making a long exposure or a short exposure, the end result is always a static representation of the world. But the great thing about doing a long exposure with photography is that you can take all of those moments that pass during the exposure and you create this cumulative representation of those moments. So as people, we perceive the passage of time kind of like when you're watching a video, one moment blending seamlessly into the next, but no moment is repeated and you just keep moving forward in that progression of moments. But a photograph, as long as you've got the shutter open, all of those moments gather together and they're put together in this one representation. So there's a lot of interesting things you can do with long exposure photography that can challenge viewer perceptions and allow you to render your subject very artistically. Now, the way you get long exposures, it really depends on what you're shooting and the level of light. If you're not shooting in bright light, if you are shooting in something that's relatively dark, let's say you're out there making photos at twilight or even at night, long exposures are easy. As a matter of fact, the trick there is making sure you can do a long enough exposure to capture all the light. But for the most part, in most shooting conditions, you can't just set your exposure time to let's say 30 seconds and expect to get good results. You're gonna to have to control the amount of light coming in through the camera to make sure you get a proper exposure. So usually what you have to do is you have to drop down your ISO or you have to stop down your aperture, use a smaller aperture so that you're letting in less light into the lens and that will allow you to do a longer exposure. And one other important technique that you can use to get longer exposures is to use what is called a neutral density filter or an ND filter. You brought, you brought a prop today. I, I brought a prop. <laughs> and an ND filter is basically just a filter that blocks light coming into your lens. And this particular filter is a 10 stop filter. Now, Lilia, hold that oh. in front of your eye and tell me what hold you it see. Hold in front of my eye. What do you see? I don't see anything. I uh, see my eye again. Okay. But so it's the, kind of purpley. I don't know. I'm trying to provide a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So basically, this is, a, this is a really thick neutral density filter. This is a 10 stop filter. And that means it's blocking a lot of light. Each stop cuts down on the amount of light coming through by half. So every time you have a stop of ND filtration to get the same exposure value as you would without the filter, you need to double your exposure time. So if you've got a one second exposure and then you put a 10 stop neutral density filter in front of your lens, that doesn't mean you get a 10 second exposure. That means you have to double that one second exposure 10 times and so we can count it out here. So one second exposure goes to two seconds, two stops is four seconds, three stops is eight seconds, uh, four stops is 16 seconds, but we're gonna round that down to 15 seconds because it makes it easier for us. Five stops is 30 seconds, six stops is one minute, then we go to two minutes, then we go to four minutes, then we go to eight minutes, and then we end up with 16 minutes of exposure time. So a 10 stop filter really cuts down on the amount of light and excuse me if I like messed up on the math there while I was counting. <laughs> math is Don't not my strong suit. Don't rely on me. I'm not really good yeah. at math either. <laughs> math I was is just not my nodding like, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. 
So, uh, but you get the idea. Basically, uh, this can cut down on light a lot. Now they make neutral density filters in strengths that are less strong than 10 stops. 10 stops is very extreme. And these filters are, are neutral gray. So as Lilia noticed as she was looking through this, this filter actually has a little bit of a blue uh, color cast to it. And the reason for that is that when you do very long exposures, the wavelength of light that's getting through that filter the most is infrared, which means that your images might end up with a really strong red or magenta color cast. So the blue on this filter is meant to counteract that and to balance the exposure so that you're not getting any color cast. With, uh, neutral density filters with less strength, like a three-stop neutral density or a five-stop neutral density filter, you don't have as much uh, blockage of the light, so you don't have that strong shift to infrared, but definitely with the eight-stop and the 10-stop filters, uh, it's good to have a neutral density filter that has color correction to balance that, uh, to make sure that there isn't so much red in the image. Now, I'm gonna take some time to show you some photographs that use long exposures creatively, and some of these are photographs where I used a neutral density filter. Some are not. Some of them are just natural conditions that uh, where everything was very dark, so I was able to do longer exposures. And in some cases, I'm using a polarizer filter, which is designed to remove glare and reflections, but also that cuts down on the amount of light coming in. So a polarizer filter also acts like a two-stop neutral density filter. So without further ado, I'm gonna pop over to a few of uh, my favorite long exposure images and just talk about some of the techniques behind them and what I'm looking for when I'm doing long exposure photography. All right. So. I have any of these awkward transitions between <laughs> uh, us talking and us looking at photos. It should all be smooth. Much, much smoother. So for this, this first photo is a photograph of a waterfall and waterfalls and streams are are really the most obvious long exposure types of images when you're doing nature photography. And I do encourage everyone certainly to experiment doing these long exposure photographs when you're photographing streams and waterfalls. But I also encourage you to move well beyond just moving water. Moving water is a little cliche <laughs> and a little too easy to do. So for this particular shot, uh, whenever I'm doing waterfall photography, I usually have a polarizer filter on my lens to remove the glare and the reflection. And it's also uh, reducing the amount of light coming through by two stops. So that means that I end up doubling my exposure twice. So usually I'm ending up with exposures that are maybe just a few seconds long. Now, when I'm doing long exposure photography, I'm usually trying to find a good mix between parts of the image that are sharp and parts of the image that are moving. So the camera's on a tripod. I'm actually in the water for this shot. I was in the water up to maybe my waist and the water was rushing past my tripod uh, with a lot of force. So I actually had to keep my hands on my tripod to minimize the vibrations that were coming up into the shot. Grips on your waders, something to keep you anchored in there. <laughs> well, so well, usually when I'm taking photographs like this, I'm holding on to my tripod for dear life. Yeah. And the only thing that's keeping my tripod from moving is me holding onto it. And as you could probably guess, that's a pretty precarious situation. It does sound pretty precarious. So you want to be careful when you're doing this type of water photography. Uh, but the reason I'm in the water and the reason why I'm doing the long exposure here is because with the long exposure, the water as it's moving past will create these compositional shapes. So in this particular photograph, there's this curve in the foreground that creates a shape that helps lead the eye into the background. And the only way this curve is revealed is through the long exposure. Now, if my exposure is too short, I get this staccato look to my photograph. So the water doesn't look like flowing water. It looks more like ice and that shape is lost. If I do an exposure that's too long, on the other hand, then the water just completely blurs everywhere and I lose the shape as well. So finding that right shutter speed in between that staccato frozen look and a total blur look, finding that Goldilocks zone can often be very difficult and you have to do some experimentation. I usually start with about a half second exposure or maybe one second exposure. And I experiment around those times, sometimes going a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. So for this particular shot, I can't remember the exact uh, exposure I had, but I think it was about a half second. So a half second with moving water is usually pretty good. Now it depends on how much water is moving and how fast it's moving and also on the particular look you want. But at a half second, I was able to get that perfect shape forming. And I had to take a lot of photographs. It just this shape doesn't just 
naturally emerge with every shot because the water is constantly moving in different ways. There's a lot of chaos. So I probably took about 30 or 40 different shots and this was the best one out of the group. All right, so moving on to the next photo. Question though, is this Cascade yeah. River? Yes, this is uh, Cascade River up in Minnesota. I was there last year and I'm going again this May, so that's why I was wondering. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's a really cool place. It's up on the North Shore of Minnesota on, on Lake Superior. It's called Cascade River State Park and mm -hmm. it's got all these waterfalls and streams and it's a lot of fun. It's a great place to go photograph. All right, so moving past moving water. In this particular shot, and this is an old shot of mine from Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I was up on top of Klingman's Dome, which is the highest mountain in the park, and I was lucky to be above the clouds. And I made this photograph at twilight, and because it was getting dark, my exposures ended up being relatively long. So this is a 30-second exposure of some fast-moving clouds. And when you're above the clouds looking down, uh, during the long exposure, the clouds take on this almost water-like look. So that's what you're seeing here. Now, the reason why the clouds look blue uh, and the sky is yellow, I shot this at twilight. I was pointing my camera towards the brightest part of the sky where the sun had set. This was maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour after sunset. So that was the only part of the sky that was still glowing with color. The rest of the scene was being illuminated primarily from light reflecting off of the blue sky above. So everything that was in shadow which was the entire landscape scene, like all the clouds in the, that were beneath me look blue. But that little bit of sky ends up being this nice warm color. This is a complementary color scheme. So when you juxtapose color opposites, it can be very effective artistically. But for this shot, I went for that long exposure because I wanted that silky smooth effect for the clouds. It looks a lot like moving water here. And as I said, it really depends on how fast your subject is moving, what kind of shutter speed you need. So at 30 seconds, I got a really nice blur to these clouds, but there's still some texture in the clouds. And that little bit of texture, I think, helps it look a lot better. So I'm always looking for that mix between texture and blur. Uh, going back to another stream shot, this was taken in the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, and spring is just around the corner. So uh, I think that that's gonna be a really great spot for uh, people in the United States looking mm -hmm. to photograph uh, the spring foliage as it pops out. You know, so once again for this shot, I waded into the water and I found this nice bowler. It's got a really nice shape to it. Uh, and what I like doing is shooting downstream with the water flowing around the boulder. Uh, what that creates, not only does do I get that shape from the long exposure, and this is probably once again, somewhere between a half second and one second, but that flowing water moving downstream, creating those leading line shapes, those curves, as it passes around the boulder, those help lead the eye deeper into the composition. So the flowing water literally pulls the viewer along with it, much like it was trying to pull me downstream. <laughs> so uh, once again, you gotta be careful. I used a polarizer for this shot as I do with most of my uh, waterfall shots. It helps lengthen your exposure. It also helps make the water look better. So all the dark parts of the water go darker with the polarizer because you're getting rid of that glare. And so that, that white, uh, motion blur stands out more. And it also, the polarizer also improves the look of the spring foliage in the background. So here is a shot from Iceland. Uh, and this is a much different type of long exposure with a waterfall. This was a two minute exposure. I took this during the Icelandic summer twilight, which lasts forever. Uh, and this particular shot was taken maybe two or three hours after sunset, but there was still a fair amount of light in the sky at twilight then this time of year. And uh, what I did here is I did a two minute exposure to capture not only the blur of the water, but the movement in the clouds that were above the waterfall. And so I needed a two minute exposure here because it was so dark out. I didn't need to use a neutral density filter or even a polarizer filter for this. Uh, it was very dark. I ended up bumping up my ISO to keep the exposure at about two minutes because I experimented with some exposures that were longer, like four minutes or eight minutes. But the problem was, it blurred the clouds too much, and I lost all texture and detail in the sky. So two minutes was the Goldilocks zones for the sky. I end up having some texture, but the clouds as they were moving through the sky blur, creating these dynamic lines, these diagonal lines that complement the lines of the flowing water. Now, this was a big waterfall. There was a lot of water going over. You can see that at the bottom part of the waterfall, that is completely blurred out because there was so much water going through that part of the scene. So that gives you an idea of what 
water will look like with a super long exposure when you have a large volume of it. It'll just take on this misty look. It'll lose all detail altogether. So the next photo, uh, once again, is clouds. And this was a shot I took in Namibia. This is called the quiver tree forest, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer because these aren't actually trees. These are a species of aloe plant, but they yeah. stand about 30 or 40 feet tall. So, so they're like a giant succulent. They are a giant <laughs> succulent. In fact, they are, they are not like a giant succulent. They are a giant succulent. But because they're 30 or 40 feet tall, they look like trees to me. So this was a shot that I took on a moonlit night and the clouds are moving. Now, when, you, when you're doing wide angle photography and you're doing long exposure photography, when the clouds are moving towards you, you can get this really interesting compositional effect. So as the clouds move towards you and past you and they blur during the long exposure, they create these lines, which become this dynamic radiating pattern of lines like you see here in this particular shot. So all of those radiating diagonal lines that go up into the corners of the image uh, make the composition overall much more dynamic. This was a 30 second exposure and the clouds were backlit by the moon. There was a full moon in the sky. You can see that in the shot uh, behind the clouds in the tree uh, in the upper third of the uh, image in the center part of the tree. You can see where the moon is, that bright portion of the sky. And so 30 seconds was enough to illuminate the clouds that were lit by the moon. Now the trees themselves were being lit. There was a, a light in the campsite that's nearby, someone had turned on. And even though the light wasn't really that bright and it was maybe a quarter mile away, it was still bright enough to light up the entire scene during this 30 second exposure that I set for capturing the, the moving clouds. So you get, once again, you get this warm, cold color contrast uh, as a result of the different kinds of light in the scene, but it was the moving clouds that made it more interesting and dynamic. So moving on to our next photo, going back to Iceland, uh, this is a shot I took of the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights. So this is a nighttime photo. There was a full moon at the time, so that's why you see this light, this bright light on the mountain in the scene. It's well illuminated. Uh, but this was a 30 second exposure. And what, the reason I chose a 30 second exposure was I needed it to illuminate the scene and to capture the northern lights properly. But also it, it allowed for a bunch of big waves to come crashing into that foreground space. There was this cove that was beneath where I was standing and there was these big 30 and 40 foot waves just crashing over the rocks there. And during a 30 second exposure, enough of the waves came in and filled that space in the cove. They came curving around. So what happens is the water filled all that space and it created this curving shape that complemented the curving shapes of the aurora in the sky above. So the moving water, the long exposure reveals the shape that otherwise wouldn't have shown up if I had done a shorter exposure. But once again, you can see with this longer uh, shutter speed, the water completely blurs out and it takes on this misty look like, like, like fog has come into the scene. So that's what happens when you you let water uh, exposures go long enough. You lose all that texture and all that detail. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It really depends on what you're looking for. So this next photo uh, doesn't really look like a long exposure photograph. This was a great blue heron that I photographed. It was standing still in the water and uh, it was twilight. So there was all this beautiful color reflected in the water from the sunset sky or the remnants of the sunset sky above. Uh, but this actually is a bit of a long exposure because the water was rippled. It was moving because it was windy. And so you didn't really see the color as well. You saw these ripples with a shorter exposure. So what I did is I took a longer exposure, like one or two seconds long, to completely blur the water so that all you see is the color that was reflected in the water. You don't see any of the ripples. But I also fired my flash during the exposure to illuminate the heron just a little bit and to freeze the heron so just in case it moved a little bit during the long exposure. And you can actually see the effects of the flash. If you look closely on the heron, you might not be able to see in the video. Uh, but um, definitely, if you get a chance to see this photo on my website, you can take a closer look at it. You can see that the ripples in the water are actually reflected on the heron, frozen by the flash. So you can see these lines, these horizontal lines coming across the heron. And that's those ripples in the water that were reflected uh, onto the heron when I use the flash. So uh, I like to mix when I'm doing, as I said earlier, with, with long exposure photography, I like to mix the stopped action with the motion blur. You can get some very creative effects. Here's another example. Uh, this was with blowing sand. So once again, moving away 
from moving water. This is the complete opposite of moving water. Uh, and I was photographing in great sand dunes in Colorado of the United States. And I was climbing up this sand dune uh, and there was this wicked windstorm. It was lifting the sand off the uh, top of the dunes and blowing it, it felt like I was, you know, I was wearing a pair of shorts and as the sand hit my legs, it felt like sandpaper running against my legs. Ouch. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, let me just say, I haven't had hair on my legs for uh, ever since that event. <laughs> I wish I could say that. It's like a natural wax. Yeah, like a natural wax, exactly. So I, I guess I kind of have some sympathy for the ladies now who go through that waxing <laughs> process a lot. I, I, I didn't- you experienced it in the sand. Yeah, it wasn't quite as bad, I'm, I'm assuming, but uh, you know, a little bit of sympathy. So in any event, what I did for this shot is I, I did a bit of a long exposure, maybe like one fifteenth or one eighth of a second, just enough to blur that blowing sand a little bit. And that creates a compositional line. So I've got the sun setting on the dune to the left. I've got that sunlit line of the dune crest on the lower right. And what connects these two compositional elements is the line of blowing sand going across from the, the lower right to the upper left. So this diagonal line connects those visual elements, it completes the composition, and it only exists because I did a long exposure long enough to reveal the motion of the sand, to blur it and create that shape. Now we're going back to moving water. Uh, so this is uh, from the Virgin River Narrows in Zion National Park, once again in the uh, United States. And I did an eight seconds exposure here. Now there wasn't quite as much water moving through the scene. Uh, there wasn't a lot of um, big rapids or anything like that. So there's not a huge mass of water moving through. And when you've got these smaller streams or you have less volume of water, you can get away with doing these longer exposures without having everything being completely blurred out and losing texture. So what happens is during the eight second exposure, I actually got a lot of textured shapes, all of these lines that are formed by that white foam of the water passing through, passing downstream. So they create a bunch of compositional lines, once again, that help push the viewer from the foreground into the background. A shorter exposure, I would have lost those compositional shapes and the overall effect would have been much less um, compelling for the viewer. So I'm always thinking about the shapes that are created by the long exposure. So the direction of movement of your subject, uh, how long the exposure is, how fast the subject is moving will all affect the final shape of the blur that's created by the long exposure. Uh, here's another shot from Iceland. I took this on the coast of Iceland and there were all these icebergs washed up on the shore and I was working with a photographer, a friend of mine, Kurt Budliger, a really great guy, great shooter. And he was out there making photographs and I was making photographs of him making photographs. <laughs> and uh, I told him to stand very still whenever <laughs> I triggered the shutter. But once again, I went for a long exposure here. So as the water was moving in and out, all these really dynamic shapes were created by the moving water. So I did a lot of experimentation. I took a lot of shots uh, trying to get the right effect. You know, it's very important which direction the water's moving. You know, usually uh, I like, like if you're on the shore and you've got waves coming in and out, usually I like when the waves are outgoing a little bit better than when the waves are incoming. And part of the reason for that is that if you've got objects on the shore that the wave is flowing around, like in this case, there's ice on the shore. Sometimes there might be rocks or pebbles on the shore. What happens is the wave flows around these objects and you get this really dynamic shape as a result as the water blurs around it. So I had to pick an exposure here that would be long enough to blur the water in the way I wanted it, to create the shapes I wanted, but short enough to make sure that Kurt in the background didn't end up getting blurred as well. So he was standing still enough so that with a one second exposure, he was sharp, but that would allow me to blur the water. Once again, on a tripod, so my camera is not moving, it's very secure, it's just the water that's moving in the scene. And this is a shot from Vanuatu. Uh, you know, we've we've looked at moving sand, we've looked at moving clouds, at moving water, and here's moving lava. <laughs> this is a volcanic explosion on uh, Yasser Volcano in uh, Vanuatu. And for this, I was doing a lot of shots at night, twilight, going between eight and 15 seconds. And I determined that those were the best times after a lot of experimentation, because when the lava exploded, when the volcano exploded, the lava would, would fly into the air and then come back down to the ground. And it usually took about eight or 15 seconds for that whole process to be complete. So an eight or a 15 second exposure, somewhere in that time frame, was enough to get these really attractive streaks of light that were the way the scene was rendered when these magma bombs were flying through the air. So it's always a good idea to do a lot of experimentation, 
with your shutter speeds to make sure you get the right effect. And then, oh, Sorry. just a few more images. Uh, oh, that's okay, yeah, we're ready, we're ready. Uh, I took this photo off the coast of Belize. I went out to the barrier reef islands that were about 20 miles away from the mainland, and it was a really rough day getting out there. Um, but when I got there, it was absolutely beautiful. There was no one else there besides me and my uh, boat captain. So while he was off uh, gathering coconuts in the trees, <laughs> I was out taking uh, photos of this beautiful um, uh, deserted island landscape. So I'm on this little island and I, I hiked out into the water and I was in the, uh, the coral reefs, these, these lava rock reefs that they have there. And I had this beautiful curving shape of the clouds in the sky and I wanted to mirror that shape in the water. So I watched to see where the waves were coming in and where they were breaking and how they were breaking. And then I chose a position facing the island, facing those clouds, where I could get the waves as they came in, creating that same curving shape. So a lot of experimentation, trying different shutter speeds, you know, between a half second and one second and two seconds until I finally got the right look. And I had one wave that came in just perfectly. You got to time it just right. I recommend using a uh, shutter remote and electronic remote when you're triggering the shutter when you're shooting uh, water. And I also recommend not using like your two second timer or your 10 second timer. You want to make sure you're hitting the shutter at the exact correct moment to get that best looking wave effect that's going to create the shape that you want. I often use live view when I'm doing these types of shots so I can watch in real time as the scene is progressing. So I know when the waves are coming in to the part of the photograph where I want them and after some practice, you learn when to trigger that shutter when you see that wave coming in to get the shape that you want. But still, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of experimentation. And uh, here's another example. This is from Iceland and same sort of thing. I had an interesting shape of the cloud in the sky. I had this big chunk of ice. Uh, I had the sun rising. I chose a position so that the sun was coming up uh, between the two horns that are sticking up at the top of this iceberg. And then I waited for a wave to come in. And as it was going out, I triggered the shutter and the wave goes around the ice, creating these nice, interesting curving shapes that help create some compositional interest in the foreground and help lead the eye to the background. And once again, it took me a lot of different shots to finally get the look that was right to create the composition that I wanted. And we're getting close to the end, I promise. <laughs> uh, once again, this is a photo I had, uh, I saw some starfish. This was on the Olympic coast in uh, Washington state. And they were uh, basically exposed. They were out of the water, but there were some, as the tide was coming back in, the occasional wave would come and splash over the rock they were on. And I wanted the waves coming in to create some compositional shapes uh, to add extra visual interest to the shot. If I had taken this without any water around the starfish, the shots would have been, would have been much less interesting. And also the waves coming in add some color contrast. So you get this, this bluer color with the waves um, contrasting really nicely with the warm, uh, brightly colored orange starfish. So I'm always thinking about the water in terms of the color and the texture and how that's going to add to the overall composition. And here we are with the final photo, uh, which is a baby orangutan in Sumatra. This is a wild orangutan. And uh, this cheeky little monkey uh, liked to investigate whenever he saw tourists nearby. He was particularly <laughs> fascinated by cameras. Uh, he was trying to grab mine. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, he wanted to take some pictures. Yeah. Who, who won it? He's an aspiring photographer. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think he's watching this podcast right now. Hello, Sumatra. Yeah. <laughs> Ask a question if you've got one. Um, so with this guy, he was swinging around and I used flash to freeze the action of the, the orangutan. But as I did that, I was panning my camera along with the movement of the baby orangutan. So as he was moving from the left side to the right side really quickly, swinging back and forth on a, on a vine, I was moving the camera with him. So the background is redder, rendered as an artistic blur, but because I used the flash to illuminate the orangutan, uh, he's rendered as shark. So a flash is a really useful techniques, technique for, for doing this mix of stop action and long exposure photography. So it's a very tricky thing to learn how to do. You have to be careful to make sure that your subject is otherwise in shadow. You want the flash to be the primary source of light for the subject because if not, 
if the, the subject is actually in the same light as your background, even with a flash, you'll end up getting this double exposure effect where the background shows through a lot. So here I had this dark canopy of trees that was mostly the background. And because I underexposed that background considerably, uh, the flash ends up being the primary source of light on the orangutan. So he looks very sharp, whereas the background is blurry. So these are just some of my favorite long exposure techniques. And now we're gonna come back to the live uh, broadcast and see if we you immediately. First, we have a question from John um, referencing the photos. Did the flash frighten the blue heron? No, absolutely not. So the, the, the heron or whenever I use flash for the animals, uh, they almost never notice. Uh, the flash at all. Uh, the only time you really have to be worried about the flash is when you're shooting when it's very dark at night and you're working with a nocturnal subject. Uh, my rule of thumb though is I always kind of let my subject guide me. If the, su if the subject doesn't seem to like the flash, I, I just don't use it. But usually, I'm usually using flash at low power and, uh, and most animals are, are really, they don't even really know what flash is. They, they're used to seeing changes in the light. Like they might be outside and there might be a cloud passing over the sun, or they might be like an orangutan might be moving through the forest and it's under the trees. And then suddenly it breaks out into the open. And so they're used to these sudden changes of light. And for the most part, they don't even notice it. And if you're using the flash at low power, uh, more often than not, the animal won't even blink. They won't even see it. They won't even pay attention to it at all. So uh, I let them be my guide. If they're perfectly comfortable, I'll use the flash um, to add some supplemental light. But if the flash is bothering the animal, then I won't use it. All right, our next question is from Rob asking, Ian, can you get a color neutral, neutral, neutral density filter? I think you wrote that twice there. Can you get a color neutral ND filter? Uh, you, <laughs> you can get neutral density filter with color. Um, you know, with, uh, with white balance being something that you can freely change before you take a photo or afterwards in the uh, raw processing phase, I don't really see any need to do any sort of uh, uh, color filtration for the most part. I do like using the filters, the long exposure filters that are balanced to keep that infrared, infrared light from coming through because sometimes it can be very hard to correct for that sort of light when you're making a white balance adjustment. But yes, there are neutral density filters that have a color filter on them as well. But for the most part, I really don't think you need to do that unless you want to, because you can make the color adjustments later when you're processing the raw file. All right, our next question is from Miroslav in Slovenia asking, do you ever run into sensor heating during the ongoing exposure? Miroslav, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us from Slovenia. Uh, so hello. And second of all, this is a fantastic question. So when you're doing long exposure photographs, when you get into the really long exposure photographs, like if you're doing several minutes or more, uh, what happens is the sensor heats up during those long exposures and you can end up getting what is known as long exposure uh, digital noise. And it's these random dots of blue, green, and red that appear in your final image. So usually you don't have to worry about that if you're doing exposures that are a few minutes or less. It's something that only really starts to show up uh, maybe when you're doing four to eight to uh, 15 minute exposure. So those longer exposures, it can be a problem. Two things you can do to mini minimize this. One, you can turn on the long exposure noise reduction on your camera. Most cameras have this feature. And what that does is it takes your initial exposure and then the camera takes another exposure of the same length of time, but it's called a dark frame exposure. It is, it is running the sensor, but without exposing the sensor to any light. So basically what it's doing is it's taking this second exposure just to find out where all those dots, all that noise is, is showing up in the photograph. And then it subtracts it from the photograph digitally. So you end up with a cleaner looking file. And the downside of this is that you end up having these exposures that are twice as long as the original exposure. So it's using more battery power. And if you've just done a 15 second or a 15 minute exposure, you got to wait another 15 minutes for this noise reduction exposure to go through. So you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs for 30 <laughs> minutes. Uh, another thing you can do is to shoot when it's cooler out. So the noise is the result of the sensor heating up. If you're shooting in the warm summer breeze, then you're going to see a lot more noise and it's going to show up even with some of the shorter exposures. But if you're shooting outside when it's winter and it's very cold out, the sensor is not going to heat up as much and you can do long exposures and not see any digital noise. I have done some winter star exposures that were two hours or longer 
and they've been perfectly clean, no noise whatsoever because it was so damn cold out. <laughs> of course, that meant I ended up being very cold. Um, but that's certainly something you can consider. Most of the digital cameras today handle that long exposure noise much better than they used to. And another key element is to make sure you get a really good exposure value. So you want to avoid having long exposure shots that are very underexposed because you'll see the noise more there. All right. Evelio asks, what ASA are you using? Ah, well, thank you for that question, uh, though I think it's funny that you use the word ASA. I can tell you're an old film guy. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a term that's fallen out of favor. So ISO is the term for the digital cameras, and that all depends on what I'm shooting and how long of an exposure uh, I want. So often to get that longer exposure, I'm dropping my ISO down to its minimum value to lengthen my exposure time. So I might be using ISO 100 or going down to ISO 50, which is supported by my Canon camera. Sometimes when I'm working in the dark, I'm actually increasing my ISO because I've got so little light coming in that even though I might want a 30 second or a minute long exposure, because there's so little light coming in, I need to bump up my ISO to ISO 400 or 800 to get to that minimum of 30 seconds or one minute. So it all depends on what I'm shooting, how bright it is, and what length of exposure that I want. First of all, Miroslav, sorry that I said you were from Slovenia. You are indeed from Serbia. I was just reading oh. it correctly in the chat. We do have, I should take a moment to mention some of the places. We have people joining us from all over. England, UK, Argentina, yes. Florida, Ohio, another Florida, North Carolina, Costa Rica, all right. Mobile Bay, Mexico, Colombia. We do have someone from Slovenia. That's where I got that from. Okay, well, so <laughs> from now on, every time Lilia misidentifies the country that you're from, yeah. Uh, Just I'm, feel free to barrage me. Yes, in the let let her know how awful she is. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. well, I'm glad. I'm so glad we have such a robust international audience. I I didn't mean to uh, give a shout out just to Argentina, but I I do. You know, Argentina is in my heart because I've been going there for many years to photograph Patagonia. So I was very excited that we've got folks from Argentina. But I'm also excited about everyone else who's joining us. All right. Our next question is from Sherman in Maryland, mm -hmm. asking: Are you keeping your ISO low for long exposures? For example, 100. So yeah, I, I think um, I just covered this in the uh, the previous uh, question. Sorry, that so was my bad that's that's okay, question. that's okay. But yeah, it, you know, it all it all depends. You know, when we talk about ISO, about aperture, about shutter speed, all these things are relative to the actual light. So none of these are absolute values. You know, so I remember once I was with a a workshop group and we were going to do some experimentation with long exposure photography, and I told everyone, all right, we're going to aim for a thirty second exposure here, and one guy. Uh, calls me over and says, Ian, I'm taking these 30 second exposures and all my shots are coming out pure white. What am I doing wrong? And I had to explain to him that he needed to make adjustments to his ISO and his aperture uh, to correspond with the longer exposure. You can't just go out there and set your exposure to a long period of time. You've got to make sure that you have the correct exposure value depending on all your variables. So you need to adjust your ISO, you need to adjust your aperture, uh, and you may need to use filtration like a neutral density filter to get the proper exposure value when you're doing long exposure photography. All right. Gustavo asks um, if you could recommend any good neutral density filters. He says he uses a brand that gives a violet color to the photos. I don't know if you mentioned what brand this one you brought with today was. Um, yeah. So this brand is... I forget who made this. Um, and it doesn't say on it? That's it bad marketing. Might. Wait, wait, Breakthrough. Right. Breakthrough Photography is the company that makes this filter. Uh, uh, and it's a pretty good filter. I've been very happy with it. I, I, for years, I've used Lee filters, and they've got something called the Big Stopper, which is their 10-stop neutral density filter. And it's got uh, a, a color filter on it to, to prevent that color cast. So that violet color cast you were seeing is the result of all this infrared light. It used to frustrate me to no end. I used to use some of the cheaper neutral density filters that didn't have that color, uh, that color correction. Then I'd get these shots that looked violet or magenta. And they, were, they looked awful and it was so hard to correct it with white balance on the computer. Uh, Singray is another really good filter company out there. I don't mean to single out any particular filter companies. There's a lot of really great companies yeah. making filters. I'm just not as familiar with a lot of them. And I, I don't really use filters that much with my photography as much as I used to many, many years ago. So I've just been using this uh, neutral density filter from Breakthrough for a while. 
so long I've forgotten uh, where I got the filter from in the first place. So <laughs> Clearly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, our next question is from Anne Goodall asking, when you're using the flash on the long exposure, is it the flash on your camera or do you have a separate flash that you are using? Okay, yeah, so usually I'm using off-camera flash and uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the cameras that have flash built in, usually that flash isn't powerful enough to reach more distant subjects. So an off-camera flash, like the one that you can put in your hot shoe or you can hold off-camera, is preferred because they have more power. And often what I'm doing during the long exposures is like with the great blue heron, for example, is I had my camera set up on a tripod and I triggered the shutter and then I had the flash handheld standing a few feet away and I triggered the flash during the exposure after figuring out the appropriate power for the flash. Uh, so for the orangutan uh, baby, the flash was on camera, but what I do then is I use a flash bracket, which gets the flash a little bit off that center axis, so it takes it off the hot shoe and moves it up and forward a little bit. And that help in, that in, improves the angle of the flash. And it also avoids getting that really discomforting eye shine. You know, like with people, it's called red eye. And it looks like they're possessed by the devil. So you want to avoid that look. So a flash bracket helps you get the flash a little bit off that center axis of the lens. And it improves the overall flash look. Before I ask the next question, I would entice you all to ask more questions because we're running low in the chat and we have lots of time. So feel free to ask a lot more so that we can answer them in the time that we have allotted. This is the first time we've been running a little low on yes. questions. So I'm either I'm much more efficient in my answers. We've just covered it all. We've, or I've, I've already covered everything and you've learned everything you need to know. <laughs> but our next question is from Michelle who asks, do you typically use prime lenses? Mm. So... Uh, I don't often use prime lenses that much. I use a lot of zoom lenses because zooms are really, really good now. It used to be that the best zoom was never as good as the best prime. Uh, but nowadays, in a lot of cases, the zoom lenses are just as good, if, if not better than the prime lenses. So in particular, with a lot of the, the new wide angle and ultra wide zooms that have come out, these lenses are so well made that they're just as good if not better than any wide angle prime out there. Now, the one area where primes really still have an advantage is with the longer lenses, like the telephotos. Uh, many of the primes are sharper than their zoom counterparts. A lot of times that's just because they're more expensive. There's a lot of like zoom telephotos out there that are aimed more at the prosumer market, so the budget uh, uh, photo enthusiast market. Uh, and, and there are some like zoom telephotos out there that are really good, like I use Canon's 200 to 400 zoom which is a superb lens that's almost as sharp as any prime lens that's out there, but it also costs like $12,000. So it, it costs a lot of money to make a really good yeah. telephoto zoom. Another advantage that primes have is they're often a lot faster. And by faster, I mean they have bigger ap maximum apertures, so they let in more light. So it's easier to capture action with a, with a, so if you've got a 600 millimeter lens and it's an F4 lens, that's gonna be better for wildlife and for action than a 600 millimeter lens that's got a maximum aperture of f8 lets in a lot more light and allows you to more easily get those fast shutter speeds um now there are also some wide angle primes that have uh, that really let in a lot of light if you're interested in doing like star photography there's been a few companies that have come out with new uh 14 millimeter lenses that have really wide open maximum apertures that let in a lot more and more light so you can do that star photography more easily uh, so those are really interesting lenses to look at. They're new. I haven't really had a chance to play with any of them myself, but I'm very intrigued by those. All right. I just would like to tell Deborah in the chat and anyone else who's wondering, yes, you can. If you missed any part of this webinar or if you, dip, if you have to dip out early, you missed the beginning, you can watch it on full re replay on the website. So it will be available. No worries if you missed the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Every episode of OPG Live is available for you to watch anytime you want to, because I know that what you really want to do is spend more time looking at us <laughs> and just listening to the sound. Yes, sound. and absorbing all of our wisdom. So. Yeah. All right, our next question is from John asking, have you used LED light panels? Oh, that, that is a great question. Uh, and I wish I could say that I have used LED mm -hmm. light panels. I have not, but they look really cool. And for me as an outdoor photographer, when I'm often trying to minimize my gear kit, the weight and the bulk of my gear kit, something like an LED light panel seems like an unnecessary uh, piece of gear to try to stuff into my already overpacked camera gear. But I would love to use them because it looks like they're a really great alternative to using flash because you can see in real time as you change the power of the LED light, it's so much easier to get the proper exposure. With a flash, you've got to experiment. You've got to take a test shot, see how it looks, 
dial the flash up or down as a result. But with an LED light, you can see that all in real time. Now, I think the, the disadvantage of the LED lights is that they won't have anywhere near the range of flash. So for most wildlife, the LED lights probably aren't that realistic to use because the subjects are a little bit farther away and uh, a little bit more unpredictable as well. And you can't just uh, get them to, to pose for you really close. But for specific outdoor photography applications, I can see that they might be really useful. So if you're working with uh, people, if you're doing some travel photography and you're working with people at twilight uh, and you wanna use a little bit of supplemental flash to illuminate a person against that beautiful sunset sky or something like that, I think that the LED panel would be really useful, but I've never used them. I've always wanted to though. That'll be your next one. Hopefully you can come back. Maybe you'll have some experience with LED panels. Yes, maybe. <laughs> That's my homework assignment. Or not, I don't know. Yeah, that is your homework. Our next question is from Gustavo who asks, when you do this long exposure in pictures, can you combine this technique doing focus stacking at the same time? Okay, um, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And the answer is yes, you can combine the long exposures with focus stacking with a big butt at the end of that. So it really depends on what is moving in the scene. So let's say the landscape is completely static, uh, but the sky, the clouds in the sky are the only thing that's moving during the exposure. You could do a focus stacking blend of the scene, the landscape scene, and then you can take that last exposure for the sky and do your long exposure and then blend in those cloudy skies into the focus stack landscape. That one is probably relatively easy to do. However, let's say the scene involves a lot of moving water and your foreground uh, is got water coming into it and you've got a mix of, let's say you've got some boulders uh, on the shore that are sticking out of the water and the water flowing around it focus stacking and blending the long exposure there becomes a bit trickier uh, because what's going on with the focus stacking, even if you're doing a bunch of long exposures for each shot in the stack, uh, the focus stack program is gonna try to blend all that together. And you'll have some scenes where the water, the movement of the water will be different looking from other scenes and where that water is might be different. So in one shot that you take for your foreground, um, there might be water around those rocks in the scene, but the second one where you've pushed the focus a little bit back, uh, there might be no water there. So the focus stacking program might have a little bit of problem stitching it together. I, I'm not gonna say that it's impossible to do, it's just much more complicated, and it's gonna involve a lot more time in Photoshop using layers and masks to make that seamless blend. So it becomes exponentially more difficult when you're working with moving subjects to do any sort of exposure blending, whether it's for focus blending or whether it's for blending uh, the exposure for an HDR effect or or anything like that. Whenever you have to blend multiple exposures together on the computer, uh, moving elements makes that much more complicated. Our next question is from Anne asking, what do you think about neutral density filters that you can turn giving you from two to eight in these stops? Yeah, that is a great question, Anne. So yes, there is something called a variable neutral density filter and it's designed to have a front element that spins. And you know, I'm not really an engineer, but what I think this filter essentially is, is a bunch of polarizer filters stacked on top of each other. And so as you spin this around, it changes the amount of filtration that's coming through the filter. Uh, and in theory, this is great because then you just need to carry one filter with you and you can dial in the amount of neutral density filtration you want. In practice, however, a lot of these filters have real problems. You can find often, especially when you're working with a wide angle lens, that the neutral density filtration is uneven across the image frame. You get some weird banding issues. Uh, and this shows up less if you're working with a longer lens, but with wider angle lenses, it becomes really apparent. Now, some of the better made ones, I think, mitigate this. Uh, I have had some experience with a lot of workshop clients who have brought these along with them, and we've tried to use them. And at the end, I've always told them, throw it out, never use it again. <laughs> so uh, I, I can't say that I've got a huge amount of experience with variable neutral density filters beyond what I just described. And that experience has largely been completely negative. So I don't personally recommend them. I prefer using just the static neutral density filters, but I bring different um, strengths with me. So usually I might bring a three stop, a five stop and a 10 stop. It's just three filters, it doesn't weigh that much, and you can stack these filters to fine tune the amount that you want. Uh, and I find that the results are much more consistent. But 
that said, take what I've said with a grain of salt. There might be some great variable neutral densities out there that I've just never used. All right, Richard asks, have you used Lee's Super Stopper? Oh, so um, I've used their Big Stopper, which is, I remember it being a 10 stop filter. Maybe the Super Stopper is something more powerful. If uh, I don't really know anything about the Super Stopper, but it sounds really super. <laughs> So, so if, uh, if Jim, if you want to leave another comment and describe what it is, like how many stops is the super stopper? I'd be curious to know if it's like 20 <laughs> stops or something like that, because at that point, you're pretty much taking a photograph through a brick wall. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that's how dark that filter would be. Yeah. All right. Our next question is from Mark asking, can you use a circular neutral density filter on a wide angle lens? Okay. Um, so, so, uh, you know, there's there's basically two types of neutral density filters out there, depending on whether you have a uh, filter holder or not. So if you're using a filter holder, like the Lee filter holder system, it's going to be a square shape. Um, and with these uh, circle shaped ones, these are screw on filters that just go on front of your lens. And you can use these screw ons with most lenses, including most wide angle lenses, um, as long as they're the appropriate size. The problem is when you're shooting with wide angle, like ultra wide angle lenses that have a bulbous front end where the glass sticks out, it's really hard to use filters on those at all. Uh, you can, but you have to get these giant fil oversized filter sets that are really expensive and they're just so big that I never use them. I experimented with them for a long time. So you can use neutral density filters, screw on filters with most wide angle lenses that don't have that protruding glass, that, that Popeye glass as they call it. So just check the, uh, the filter thread for your lens uh, and uh, make sure you get a filter of the right size and you should be okay. So something like the Canon 16 to 35 or the Nikon, uh, I think theirs is either a 16 to 35 or a 17 to 35. Some of those standard zooms, and these are for full frame cameras, there's different uh, lenses for the uh, crop sensor cameras. Some of those standard wide angle zooms, you should be just fine with, perfectly okay. All right, and I don't know if you talked about this when talking about the orangutan um, and we were talking about flash, but John asks, what flashlight modifiers do you use? All right, so uh, fantastic question. I use two, maybe three general accessories with my flash. So in addition to the flash bracket that I described earlier, on front of my flash, I'll sometimes use what's known as a flash extender. And this is designed to extend the range of your flash to eliminate more distant subjects. So it's basically a Fresnel lens that you put in front of your flash. And it acts like a, it's the same thing with a lighthouse. It's the same sort of lens. It focuses the beam and sends it out further. But more often than not, what I'm using is a device called a snoot or a flash grid. Now a snoot and a flash grid, they're both designed to narrow the beam of light. Uh, so that way you can selectively illuminate your subject and not get all that spillover light around your subject. So when I'm shooting wildlife, that's usually what I'm using is a snoot or a grid. A grid is a basic accessory that focuses the beam. The, a snoot allows you to fine tune that focusing effect. You can pull the snoot out and you can change how far it comes out in front of the lens and that, that increasingly narrows the beam. All right, I would just also like to add, Richard adds that Lee's Super Stopper is a 15 stop. Filter. Ooh, 15 so. stop, that is really exciting. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Richard for, uh, um, for clarifying that. Did I, I might have accidentally called you Jim before. That was Richard, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry, I called you Jim before. <laughs> We're messing up all sorts of things, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I'm guessing you're from you're from Slovenia, right? <laughs> Somebody is in the chat, <laughs> but... Okay, I just lost the other question. Oh, Vasanta asks, have you combined both ND and PL filters? If so, is there a correct method as to which goes on the camera first? Okay, this is a, a great question, and I'm not sure I remember the answer. But yes, you can, you can combine neutral density with polarizer filters. Uh, I don't think that there's necessarily an order you have to put them on, except that if you're using screw on filters, you want to have the polarizer, probably the polarizer on the front, uh, because that way you can twist the polarizer ring more easily. Um, though I guess you could have the polarizer on the back with the neutral density on the polarizer and just twist the whole thing. I don't think it really matters. Uh, but yeah, so there's no particular order that you need. I don't think one blocks the other or anything like that. Uh, and I have used them, as a matter of fact, I use them together a lot because a lot of times I'm using the polarizer to reduce glare and reflections in the scene. So absolutely, you can use these filters. Just remember that if you're using screw on filters, if you are stacking the filters, you can, if you're working with a wide angle lens, you can actually start seeing the edges of the filter in your shot, it's called vignetting. Uh, and filter holder systems are designed to prevent this vignetting, allowing you to stack more filters. So it might be easier to use multiple filters then.
All right, and I think it's time for our last question. All right. Our question is from Arlene asking, do you have any recommendations for a wide, wide angle lens for neutral density filters? Well, okay, so that's a rather open-ended question. because there's a broad a lot, one. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different cameras out there. There's a lot of different wide angle lenses. There's, there's different size sensors. So uh, I don't really have a recommendation for that. My only recommendation, if you're buying a wide angle lens and you plan to use it with filters, is make sure that you don't get one of those ultra wide lenses with that Popeye glass that extrudes from the front of the lens. So if, if it looks like an eyeball staring at you going past the, yeah, then, then you're gonna have a difficult time using filters. So that's a very uh, specific category of lenses. So like fisheye lenses, and uh, these ultra wides like the Canon 11 to 24 or the Nikon 14 to 24 or the Tamron 15 to 30, those are all Popeye lenses, but there's plenty of wide angle zooms out there that don't have that Popeye that are gonna be easy for you to use filters on. So I think that is all we have time for in terms of questions. I want to thank you all for joining us and thank you for all your wonderful questions. Uh, please join us. I think our next OPG Live episode is on May 14th, I believe. That sounds about right. Too. Sounds about right. Don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> but it's going to be an exciting new format. We're going to yeah. have this beautiful new background. We're going to have a much different system. Uh, I think you're going to love it. And in honor of spring finally beginning to emerge here <laughs> in the northern, I know yeah. this is the northern hemisphere. Spring is just beginning to happen. I'm going to dedicate the episode to tips on taking spectacular spring photographs. Oh, so think of your questions now. So we have tons of them. Yes, yes. We never run out of questions, no. actually. So, but I do appreciate all your questions. These are all wonderful questions. And I want to thank you all for being a part of this creative journey with me. I'm hoping that together we can take the best photographs that you've ever taken. So thank you very much. I'm Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And thanks for watching. Bye. See you next time. Bye-bye.